Catherine, once upon a time, once upon a time in the East, called A Stunning Memoir, which picks up where John Chang's 1991 bestseller Wild Swans left off. Riveting, Guao Lu Bo is bold, angrier and more ambitious than her forebearers. Xiao Lu Guo, she's really one of the, I think for me, the key figures in opening up a dialogue between, as you mentioned, uh, this time, uh, once upon a time in the East. But I noticed that you also quote Rudyard Kipling, is saying, East is East and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. Uh, of course, we know that. And yet, if we continue a few more lines into the ballad of East and West, till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat, that there is neither East nor West, border nor breed nor birth. And I think about that when I read your book, that it has these so many layers and so many interesting ideas of being a poetic drama played out in different narratives and different identities. How do you feel about that? Would you say that that's something that resonates for you in your Once Upon a Time? Oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is very tough to start with, to answer such a question. Um, you know, as a writer, you, um, I think, it, I mean, someone like me, I think, always, you know, kind of driven by, by a few ideas, you know, to, to gather the materials of your life, you know, and, and other people's life, to, to, to try to find a structure and a form, you know, to, to put down those materials. Mm -hmm. And the forms often, you know, could be, I think, inspired from, from you know, those great poets, they, you know, the, the big ideas they suggested in their book, all big filmmakers, which I adore, you know, and I try to kind of cook those ideas in, in, in the narrative. So it's very difficult to, because I think from a critic's point of view, you know, it seems, it all makes sense. You know, if you read my early book, my, my, you know, my book now, you know, it, it's this con coherent journey, but for a writer, I think for artists, it's so, sometimes I think, <coughs> by this primitive energy to, to write, you know. And this per primitiveness is not self-conscious. You know, you, you, you're burned by some desire to, to narrate, to write. And so often, I'm not as clear as you when you when you read the book. <laughs> you know, I'm just kind of in this zone of this kind of narrative, you know, and, and a kind of emotional struggle, you know, mm -hmm. for the characters. Even though you know that might be me, but still, it's a character. You know, yes. Like, yeah. Well, should we just set the scene a little bit? I'm sure many of you are here would like to know more about the book and, and um, her memoirs. But also, just to begin with the idea of Once Upon a Time, it's a story of growing up, but yet despite its fairy tale over the time, it's a really, really hard read for me because it's incredibly poignant. It has some heart-wrenching passages. And I just want to say on first reading it that I was totally blown to smithereens because I thought, my goodness, there's so much going on here, some unspeakable passages, at times so fierce, it's intimate, <coughs> there's some great expectations in the book for you, for your life, amazing human experiences, and some beautiful counterpoints. And also, I think this may, I don't know what you feel, but there's some rich mental imagery going on. When you read the words, I almost feel I can visualize some of the stories that are going on in this. And you talked about emotions just now, and I think for me, certainly, it stirred in this reader something that was just taking me into my own past and made me feel quite emotional at times. I'm absolutely certain that these kind of universal resonances of our experiences of our childhood come out. And of course, um, most of you will know when Jerry Burrell was born, she, her parents handed her over to a childless peasant couple in the mountains. <laughs> And so she was only two years of age and suffering from malnutrition, had a diet of yam leaves and leaving Yijia with her, Ill her illiterate grandparents then in a fishing village on the East China Sea. So it's been called a strange beginning. How far back can you say that I that mean, was for you? A writer like me, I often suffer you know, from the, this kind of blur you know, the publisher will write and that seems sums up all your book. You know, and, uh, I think I, I have, you know, I, I suffer from that kind of limitation. I think because I am a knowing and ambitious person, so I think a book should go beyond those blurb. And but very sad, you know, each book, each book, I want to go beyond what's supposed to be, you know, what, you know, what, what could be delivered behind and beyond the, the narrative layer, some vision, you know, some kind of political idea, you know. But then it's often it's not blurb, you know, on the blurb. So I think. 
in the US, I think the globe is completely differently um, down, and I suggest the focus on the, on the ground are seen in China in the 1990s, when I was a, a student in Beijing in the, in the 1990s. So, I mean, you can kind of imagine <laughs> what kind of person I am, you know, but I try to be diplomatic and polite. But anyway, so come back to this. Um, I, I guess, you know, for me, this book is very natural to write after my struggle with English language, you know, as my second language, you know, write all these novels. I think the last five or six novels I wrote originally in English was kind of painful struggle. Mm -hmm. Because, as you know, because I came to the UK when I was 29, I was nearly 30 years old, without knowing much of English, you know, a few sentences. You know. And I think the transition as a writer, as a Chinese writer, which I published about nearly nine books in Chinese language before I left, left China, and then suddenly pick up this raw language, and I was already quite old, you know, 30 years old woman, try to pick up another language which I don't belong to, you know, and also I don't have absolute, kind of, I don't have trust with the second language, you know, I, I, because I was that generation, you know, wasn't exposed enough to English, you know, and I think the young Chinese now, so exposed to English language, you know, they could switch, but I was kind of old enough, but also I was an old-fashioned writer, which believe language is identity, so I thought my identity is a Chinese writer. So when I switched to write in my last six, seven books in English, I think it's kind of the loss of identity and the re recreating of my new identity, which goes beyond the national identity, of course, you know, the, the, the one you mentioned, the transnational identity, you know. But that's not a fancy word, it's mm -hmm. a word you really, you know, was born by survival instinct, you know, to be continued as an artist in the West, I have to survive with a new language. And sadly enough, you're a writer, you use words, your language, the language is imprinted with national identities, you know, what kind of language you use to write your novel is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And I wish, you know, on one hand, I, I was a painter, I was a visual artist, therefore I think my, my work can be, <laughs> you know, go beyond this kind of painful struggle with words, mm -hmm. self-translating, but not only linguistic translating, but cultural translating, you know. Mm -hmm. And therefore I think I was making all these films, um, I think try to, to enter into the world which narr narrative and identity can be portrayed as through my film is through images, you know, and I think it doesn't have to be you know, well-educated a person to understand the film. You know, it could be just quite democratic, you know, from peasant to a professor could watch film with the same passion, perhaps. You know. mm -hmm. So I, I, I think what I try to say is this book is after my 15 years living in mainly Europe, Britain, Germany, my kind of surrender to to the past, which could be narrated in, the, in my second language. Because the past could only be narrated in first language, which is your mother tongue. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if people call it memoir, I don't call this book memoir because I don't believe such a full memoir in Chinese. We call it someone prose, the prose essay, which mm -hmm. is largely kind of non-fiction. And the someone prose essay is the highest form, you know, okay, below poetry. But novel is, of course, trivial form. You know, novel is kind of commercial product in a way, you know, nowadays. So I was loyal to that form. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I thought, after all these English books, I have to um, work on this book, you know, true to my memory. But the surrender to this language I adopted, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was, you know, the process was alienating because I'm writing in English about a childhood which wasn't in Mandarin Chinese, you know, the, the childhood was Hakka, you know, my, mm -hmm. my grandmother, grandfather spoke Hakka, you know, Fujian, Minnan dialect in my mm -hmm. village. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with them for seven years, I spoke Hakka. So I, trans I translated that into English, tried to be authentic, but you know, authentic is just a lazy word, I mean, it's always translation. And then when I become, you know, Teenager, so I pick up a Ling dialect, which is very close to Shanghainese language. Mm. You know, it's just a dialect in Zhejiang province, and that was the dialect I was speaking with my parents. 
And that is also the translation. Because if it's a local dialect, you know, the way we spoke is quite raw and nearly primitive and very, the language is quite materialistic. You know, the bench is bench, glass is glass. You know, it's, it, it's not intellectualized. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, there's a raw energy in those language. And for me, that is also translation. And then when I came to Beijing, 19 years old, that was a Mandarin, you know, I spoke Mandarin and write in the proper Chinese Mandarin language. And all this, I think, you know, when I was writing this book, I realized the layer of translation I was doing. Mm -hmm. And yet that's a past, you know, yeah. kind of this different layer of past. Let's get into because I was thinking with the transnational identity, there's also the concept of the a cosmopolitan nomad, who's somebody, as we know the word, the cosmopolitan Absolutely. today, but Absolutely. previously. If you think of the Hakka people, they were also the guest people, if, if I'm correct. Yeah. The guests, so they would move Absolutely. and relocate you know, yeah. their homes mm -hmm. and their families. Did you have that sense of place and displace at the same time, home and unhome? Do I have that sense? Every day. <laughs> every, every, every second. I mean, the, of course, you know, I mean, you know, I was a nomad, you know, we were, the, we were supposed to be a minority, which means from Central Asia. You know, from Muslim, you know, Turkic, you know, Mongol, that area. You know, my, my grandparents, my grandfather's family, they were Hui Muslim coming down to South China. Oh. Typical story. Where's Hakka from? You know? I mean, I, I don't want to bore you because if you don't read the history, you might find it boring. But there's so much Jewishness in Chinese identity which never been discussed. And I felt I'm completely Jewish in the Chinese <laughs> sense. <laughs> this, this strong roots and it's actually always ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. And also the historical you know, diaspora, you know, the Chinese went to the overseas, mm -hmm. began a very sad story as a laborer, as a slave. You know. And that was, I think, not popular narrative in a way. You know. mm -hmm. and that was very little discussed in the, in the mass media. But also the perpetual, you know, nowadays the Chinese immigrant overseas, you know, only a bit, a few are rich, but, but mostly, you know, students or the laborers or the workers, you know, the, the petite businessmen, you know, really dedicate their life to, to work, to rest, restaurant business, you know, bury their future for, for their children, you know. That is nomad, you know, because the home you constructed is a representation of the home. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's typical nomad, you know, you have a tent, and then you move on, you, you undo that tent, you move on to another place. Mm -hmm. And I've, I often wondered about my, you know, so-called Hui minority background, how, you know, how did that decide my, you know, my current future, or my past future, you know, mm -hmm. when I was young, you know, that nomadness, I don't, you know, I know that no such word, no madness, but somehow I always use the word no madness. <laughs> you know, it's in my blood. Yes. And, and perhaps that takes me back a little to the idea of we know the phrase once upon a time is used obviously to start many children's stories a long time ago in the past. But also, um, I don't know what you feel about this, but it's sometimes reflecting a kind of nostalgia or a melancholy, but regrets or things that are no longer happening or do you think there is a sense of nostalgia or a longing for the notion of a home rather than home being at the moment? You mentioned as you, in time, you returned to the village a little later to find your grandmother's house was a hair salon. Did that make you feel sad or nostalgic for what you've lost, even though at the time it was not where you wanted to be? I mean, I think the discussion of home is like nearly like every day's discussion of all. Since the modern migration movement, which started when? 200 years ago, let's say, after, after the colonial time, or last 100 years, or oh, John Berger said, you know, only last 30 years, the mass immigration movement globally, or, oh, you know, the, you know the, the, the economical refugee and the political refugee, you know. And in a way, when we say refugee, we think of those Syrian refugees, but we are refugees, you know. And I, I'm immigrant, I'm absolute immigrant, which means once you left, you couldn't return because this structure you build in the current life is desperate to resemble the past home you once had. Mm -hmm. But once you return, you know, that home was completely a shamble. You know. Nostalgia is quite negative energy in a way. You know, 
we, we poeticize nostalgia, mm -hmm. but could be completely ne negative you know, deconstruction <laughs> of your reality. You know? um, and of course, you know, for, philosophically, we are completely alienated. You know, if you're from Yorkshire and you live in London, you are you are sort of refugee in a way. You are you are sort of migrant because the structure is completely different. London is, has no roots. You know, the roots of London is is the, the, the is the result of industrialization. Mm -hmm. The invention of the workers, for example, is a pure industrial revolution invention. Workers meaning move away from your homeland yeah. to work alienating yourself in the inhuman factory to earn the wages, to bring back the home which is no longer your real original home. So you are just unplugged, mm -hmm. uprooted. And that, in that sense, I say, you know, I'm just like everyone. Everyone is in a way like you. You know, you have the immigrant roots, which is John Berger said, we are living in this mass immigration time. You know, mm -hmm. you have to cope. Even if you never moved, your children, your grandchildren had to cope, or, or is coping. You know, that life. When I when I went back to my hometown in the end of the book, I because I detest the sentimental sentimentality, so I wrote in a very cold way. Mm -hmm. It's a fashion, fashion hair salon. I, I think I really felt that, that as much as it was intimate, it was really raw as well. I mean, it was hard hitting. I felt you were being honest with yourself. But I also maybe just take you back to what you were saying about work just now. Because you said all my work is sort of born from solitary <coughs> labor, solitary labors. And for me, I'm interested in the linguistic play on the notion of work because it can also mean uh, to labor. You know, to work, travail in French is to work, to labor, but it's also um, travail, uh, labor is uh, incarceration. Um, I don't know if you know that there was this um, pen that was built for cattle to keep them in, literally, in this place. And I find work being this idea that you're mm -hmm. sort of fixed into root the rootedness, but at the same time, you know, it can also mean to go into labor, a distinctly female um, mm -hmm. notion of referring to a woman about to give birth. So I'm just wondering, could you expand on how your writing is born out of this solitary labour for you? Would you say, what does that mean, in moments of solitariness, or you need to find that silent space, is it solitary? I think both, you know, the physicality, you know, the physicality of a writer is completely, it's a very lonely reality, you know, I think maybe that's the most tough thing to be a writer, you know, I don't mean a writer for one book, you know, if you're married to that tradition of writers, for example, I started writing when I was very young, 12, 13, but nearly professionally, you know, I was published 14, 15, so that was the doomed beginning, which means there's a hope to be a writer to be published. I was published so young that I committed to that destiny, so I basically, the future is cancelled, or I, tomorrow the future is to write. Mm -hmm. So to write me and refuse all the invitation to the reality. Refuse the invitation to the party, you know, to the reality, basically. Party is kind of happening, what's happening. Refuse to that so you can be alone to write, because you cannot write two person or three person or in the, in the, in the, in the alive, living world. Mm -hmm. So this deliberate cut off from the life, from the future, <coughs> is uh, cruel, it's the most cruel reality, you know. And, uh, because, I mean, so far I think I wrote, I published maybe 20 books um, in Chinese and in English. And the plus I made like 10, 10 films or something, you know. And I taught, I teach everywhere. So, which is, I have no life. And it's like Magridura said, you know, Magridura said, why are you fascinated by my life? My life is cancelled, my life dedicated to my writing. So the narrative is only alive in my narrative. <laughs> and I'm not alive in front of you, you know. <laughs> and it, it's not it's not a sad comment, it's just the nature of being a writer. And I refuse in a way, you know, as as Patti Smith said, you know, Patti Smith said that when I when I wrote the lyrics, I dance around in my room, I refuse to sit down, I refuse to surrender to that form of solitude. Mm -hmm. And I exactly felt what Patti Smith said, you know. When I wrote and I know, you know, I I was doing ten different things, cooking looking after child or you know dealing with film crew, calling, emailing, you know. There's constant need, superficial need for certain reality around me. So therefore life doesn't cancel me out. 
and I don't cancel the iPhone, although even that's superficial reality, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, so that's a labor like you committed to it. And of course, it's both mental and physical labor, you know. When you mentioned that, the woman giving labor, that's a great metaphor. But for me, it's not metaphor, it's just pure reality. You know, it's the essence of the daily life, it's right. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I try to make film you know, every year to refuse my solitude. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps we can start with a beginning as a newborn baby, as we mentioned, being given away by your parents. Um, do you do you sort of sort of reflect on why? Because some people did say to me when they read the book, why do you think that that happened? Did you ever ask them? I mean, directly, why they did that? Oh, well, for me, I think. I mean, it's no longer me. If you write yourself in the book, it's a character because that's the only way to write. Yes. You know, so I don't have this sentimental attachment to the character, which is called a Guoshalu or whatever. But it's normal. If you're born, if you know China a little bit, if you, if you were born in the 1960s, 70s, like me, it's a collective life. It's parents surrender to the work, complete the work you know, in the factory, in the work unit. The children would be looked after by grandparents or not being looked after. They grew up in the community, you know, a certain kind of compound yard. You know, you know, your neighbor will help. You know, your grandparents, if they are alive, they will help you. It's the typical, that time, 60s, 70s, and also it's typical, baby girl was abandoned. It's nothing sensational, you can make it into sensational news, but instead you should study the history of China, you know, why that phenomenon is just continued, a norm, and a norm is a horrible word, you know, because when something so abnormal become norm, um, it's a collective, you know, acts, you know, behaved, you know, by every individual yeah. mm -hmm. in their society, you know. Um, and I think China went such a trauma in the last, say, 100 years. So, in the West, you know, I think the major, you know, the mass media are often very negative about China. But if you really kind of felt, you know, studied the recent Chinese history after Opium War, if I don't mention Opium War, Sorry. <laughs> I mean, China is in this devastating state right after the Opium War, you know, and I think, you know, after the, the Qing Emperor, you know, after the last emperor, the civil war, the, the terrible civil war, which my grandmother in this book, you know, encountered and told me you know, all these crazy stories, and then the Japanese war, and the, the same she told me those crazy stories about Japanese soldiers leaving shit in the walk, and that's the only thing they have after the looting in the village. You know, one of the little trivial details, and then come into the communist revolution. You know, equally violent, but brings hope. And then there's purge within the communist party, and then the cultural revolution. You know, and then come to the one-child policy. Those violent turmoil every ten years or every five years. If you study that history, you no longer ask for why. You, say, you would instead you would say, how could anyone cope? But then. Perhaps you don't ask anyone. You know, you, you, I think once you understand the turmoil of society, you kind of like, God, we, let's not do it again. <laughs> you know, other society, but we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's just say that when you describe your childhood, um, and perhaps we encourage you to read a, a passage for us. What's also striking was the emotional poverty. It seems to me that you were really trying to struggle with not just what was happening to you, your, your relationship we can go into with your grandparents. Um, and some of those profound human emotions, to me, came so much part of the early part of the book. Um, and yet you had some quite buoyant moments where you described, for example, your grandmother holding an ice lolly in her snotty handkerchief, but she wanted to keep it really cold for you. And she held this and she came to find you wherever you were. And it, to me, was such a precious gift. It was worth more than got its weight in gold if she thought of you and she loved you. And so I just wondered this idea of um, saying at the end of your book that it's, love, it's a love letter to your own child in a way. And I, I really love this idea that it's a gift back to yourself and to your childhood that your grandmother gave you this gift as well. Does that resonate for you? I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you, you mentioned this. Um, I started this 
being good at this Icelandic being detail because I, I, re I remember you know each book you started with with kind of scene or a visual, a visual scene you know. When I was writing that before I had anything, so I remember you know just this very small, tiny this this old lady who happened to be my grandmother. You know, totally hunchbacked, running on her little, little feet, try to give me this melting thing. You know. It was completely sorrowful. Yeah, it seemed quite sorrowful, but at the same time, there was a humor when you read it. You no, know, I think it's there's a humorous element to it as well, just because there was this idea that she's looking for you before the ice slowly melts. You know, that it's almost sort of uh, yeah. like a kind of caricature, but not a poem, but just of the moment, that sort of absurdity within everything else that was abject poverty. This wonderful ice lolly was trying to reach you. And I thought that was just something of a, a wonderful metaphor for me, of, of life being so meaningful when so much around your world at that time didn't seem to make sense. I guess I think one thing is the emotional poverty, which I reflect upon you know, with my, many of my novels. I mean, this is not novel. Um, and I, I do wonder, you know, really is that true? You know, I grew up in completely, you know, in this emotional poverty. So then suddenly the image of my, my dying grandmother holding this ice, ice cream for me, running, searching for me, you know, when I was such a child. And I thought, God, you know, we just didn't have this word as Western use all the time, love. You know, we don't put it in our mouth. Mm -hmm. Yet we consume it in such a stoic way, you know. And I think it's as if love is buried. But you know, if I dig out, you know, and that's one of the things manifested that kind of love, which is unspoken, complete stoic, um, so earthy, you know. And I, I, I remember I was writing that scene again, and again, try to make it perfect. And then eventually it's like painting, you know, overpaint, you know, overpaint, you know, heavy handed. You know, I remember the cut, two pages. Um, I remember one when, when conversation with my editor, they said that it's an amazing scene, but what do you think it should be repeated so long? <laughs> like, so I was so you know, emotionally attached to the scene, and I remember I was writing for so long before I had this book. Um, and of course, I over it in a repetitive way. And I had painfully cut that. There's many pages, and now it's like a page. Uh, you know, just like, how do I, you know, could I consume that, you know, poverty of love, or the manifestation of love you know, within a page? Mm -hmm. You know, I refuse to, to cut, in a way, you know, like, I yeah. refuse to see the love is being diminished, you know, within the quantity of words. And I think, if I can just pick out a couple of threads and themes that I was really drawn to, mm -hmm. Um, one of them was also trauma, because obviously it's very fair to say that you've had an incredibly vivid, yet also traumatic childhood. But it's also punctuated with these deeply poignant moments, as you, we mentioned the word love and your grandmother. And then you've sort of got angry and said about this shithole of a life. And for every child suffering a trauma, I think we still bear the scars as adults. And so some of us as adults lead a life there. We can we agree that sometimes out of the trauma, some kind of really creative force can emerge? I mean, I don't want to suggest it's you know, the, the, the artist in the attic who has to struggle, but there must be something in this that made you become a writer to want to put this in words, <coughs> this experience. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think every child is looking for a model, a role model, you know, when they were young. And I, it was very clear in my life, my role model was my father. You know, and he was a painter, but yet he was a state painter. He, most of his life, he had to paint those big propaganda posters. Mm -hmm. In Chinese, we say high above. So it's a very skillful <clears throat> state painter, you know, a picture of Mao, you know, red armies, you know, crossing the Geneva Desert, you know, you know, peasant, you know, or farmers, you know, happily grow. You know, all their vegetables in the yard, you know, those large posters. And I remember my father was painting it, laboring again, laboring on it. Um, and I remember, you know, maybe I was 10 or 11 or 12, my father one day complained. He said, Western paintings just have landscape. They don't need to put so many peasants and soldiers in it. <laughs> 
And then there was such a strong statement, you know, for you, for, for me to hear, you know, you know. And then because, you know, we no longer do the ink wash painting, you know, I, although my father, you know, in his spare time, he does still the ink wash painting. Mm -hmm. And my, my brother was trained as the ink wash painter, you know, he's a very good painter. But still, you know, my, my father is, was paid to paint those posters. Mm -hmm. And one day he showed us, you know, Van Gogh, you know, my first Van Gogh memories, like he showed us, look, the wheat fields, there's no peasant in it. <laughs> <laughs> Contrast, you know, he's like, why do we paint the landscape? It's women on the tractors all the time, you know. Take all the tractors. So we always have to light, you know, in the landscape painting, you know, tractors. And then soldier very happy, smiling, you know. And I think he was very, very what's the word, you know, he took so seriously, he was bitter about he has to do ten soldiers plus twelve peasants in the picture, you know. He was bitter about that. And that led me to a world of, you know, kind of oh, unfamiliar, <coughs> pure landscape, you know, pure poetic nature mm -hmm. without human being, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that, I'm sure that was very, you know, yeah. the beginning of me, you know, how to become a writer, you know. And I know I was very uh, apolitical, oppositely apolitical, just want to be so-called some kind of pure poet, refuse to have even stories in, in, in my poem. Because mm -hmm. I even see narrative as a dirty form, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that at the beginning of whatever you call it, young writer. Mm -hmm. But it seems you were very observant as a, as a child. You you saw everything around you. you, you your family life or your grandparents' life. You were very observant about your grandmother's role in society, the sort of domestic um, hierarchies, and how she herself had you felt suffered in her life. I mean, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Did it come to you a bit later to see how, how the relationship was? Or was it immediate at the time? that you Because you said it, it happens to everybody. You know, It wasn't like it was just a one-off that happened in one household. It was I might just say a little bit, uh, yes, and then I, I should read a little bit of this, mm -hmm. so, so I don't talk too much, because you might want to hear a little bit. Um, I mean, to answer your question, I would say, you know, it's not me remembering the childhood or China. It's not me. It's, it's the intellectualized writer, a woman writer, intellectualized, politicized writer, try to portrait a society which is so crazily rigid, yet at the same time so vivid, so painful, mm -hmm. so full of wonder and, and, and tragedy. Mm -hmm. So it's not me. It's intellectualized, com you know, completely an artist working for the narrative. You know, I think that's the difference of when a woman writer, when a woman artist on the stage, people say, oh, so what happened with your love life? You know, what is the story? And I think if, if she is a good writer, if she's a good artist, she has to intellectualize all these trivial and magnificent details to, 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 to completely transform them. So you are no longer a trivial diary writer. And that's the, the difference between a gossip writer and a, a writer, you know. I mean, otherwise we should just read the song every day, it's the evening standard. You know, because, but that's another place to, to become a writer because... So I, I would say, you know, I refuse to speak from very kind of primitive um, style, you know, what happened to me days where I could then... It's not right, because I think, I think there's a dignity as an intellectual, and then there's a real person there which you treat as materials. Mm -hmm. you know, it, once you discover that, you can become a better artist. <laughs> you know, I think for me, it just takes so many years to discover that. Um, you know, I, I think it's a huge, hugely important thing you know, to, to be an artist. Mm -hmm. so, so when you, you know, mention how I remember those life, my grandparents and my years in Beijing, you know, in the Beijing Film Academy, trying to become a filmmaker and they came to the West, it's, it's me playing different identity and different point of view. And sometimes criticize Confucius, sometimes imitating the second sex, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, mm -hmm. sometimes purely paying homage to the writers and the artists I love. Mm -hmm. So I, I just play with the materials in order to shape that woman 
in the multiple world how she functions mm -hmm. in, in the multiple world. I think that there's some um, threads with Marguerite Dura and uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and for me, a writer called Alain Sixou, who's Algerian, uh, but in France, she had this similar sort of multiple identity, and I remember reading <clears throat> in Mon Algerian, she said, I weave a magic carpet, I take flight, and I feel perfectly at home nowhere but in the act of writing. Mm. And I think from what you're just saying, it is that writing, though, as a woman, I'm just wondering, is there something about this idea that everything a woman writes is confessional? Now, that's quite a controversial statement, but would you take that on as a comment that you feel? Because you have an amazing ability to express your strengths, um, at the same time facing old, rigid notions of masculinity, femininity, but domestic violence and conflict was part of your upbringing, I'm thinking particularly of your grandparents, but do you think that coming to writing is because of gender, or is that really not something that you, for yourself, writing as a woman, is um, relevant? So I think, uh, even 10 years ago, I think I was a writer more, what's the word, you know, kind of, you know, I was a driven, primitive writer, you know, which means, you know, what kind of materials I have in my life, I, I, I pour out on the page, which with a certain form. But, but it's a, but I was a writer without form or language, in a way, you know, and I think that could be equally powerful, but I think as you grow a bit older, you want your particular language and form, mm -hmm. whether it's confessional, whether it's something else, you know, your ambition is, is looking for that language which belongs to your writing, you know, not a linguistic language, mm -hmm. a, a, a style, a, a personality, you know, like a painter. You know. Mm -hmm. you know, every painter has his own language, you know. I think that become such a huge thing, I think, for me, you know, whenever I read something, I, I imagined my sentence could go to that kind of direction. Or my, my, my tone, my the colour of my book, you know, could mm -hmm. go. So of course I was paying huge attention to the social injustice in the in the in the Chinese society, but also the, the, the craziness in the Western society. I was paying attention but I still need to find a way the language to deliver them. So I, I do think the book's kind of different. Um, I think the first two chapters about magical in a way, because I left so long ago, so they become this own tale. You know, there, there's a personality of as this crazy fairy tale, mm -hmm. and then the last two chapters about London or West, I had to cut up a lot before publication because I lived in Paris for two years uh, making films, and then I lived in Berlin and Hamburg for nearly two and a half years, and then I returned to London, and I met a lot of people. You know, there's very busy physical life as a woman sexually and, uh, and artistically. Mm -hmm. I had very kind of chaotic, and I think that period, it wasn't here because I didn't find the language to write about my Western life, mm -hmm. which means the language is so close to daily life that the lack of literary language, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have the magical quality. So I had to basically I had to delete all those chapters. And I remember I said, oh, maybe it would be another book, you know, I think it was also impossible to look upon very current life to to have this intense literary quality, you know. So it's again, you know, one of my favorites of this French theorist theorist called the guy Debord. Guy Debord, yeah, the, the situationist, I think, wrote this book in 1967 called The Society of Spectacles. Mm -hmm. He said that the authentic life is completely disappeared. In modernity, modern life no more authenticity because we live totally in the representation of a lifestyle we're supposed to live. So if we say you know we take easy jet go to the seaside in Spain, we are purely imitating that lifestyle without experience the authenticity of that real life. The fisherman's life is only a little tourist hut, the fisherman's hut. There's no true you know. Authenticity, and I, I felt that, you know, when I was reading that book, um, and I thought, God, you know, it's so on the mind that book, you know, it's, it's so much talking about the current reality, you know, we are living this commercial promo promotion, you know, every single thing is the 
<laughs> commercial promotion, you know. And I think a really lack of this concrete touch and feeling, you know, it's all a representation of the reality. And I, I was not able to write this. So I had to just take out those big chapters and then remain, you know, this book early part. Um, so these are the remains of your days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to choose yeah. something for yeah. us to, to hear? Or? I think before we run out of time, I'm just going to read a prologue so I don't give away, even though I give away everything already. <laughs> <laughs> so the prologue is supposed to kind of, you know, the prologue is always like supposed to open the book, but prologue is always written after the book finished. You know, it's always artificially you know, rewritten after you have the whole book in order to you know, take the readers into the world they might be not familiar at all. So I remember I was writing this prologue when the book is about to be published. And I said, oh, I miss, I miss this prologue. Okay. Um, so that's just beginning with this book. Uh, a wanderer, uprooted and displaced, a nomad in both body and mind. This would, would I have become. This description summed up my last 14 years of life in the West. It had been a life of transit, change, forgetting and adapting. Then all of a sudden, I realized that I had turned 40 and that my belly was expanding. The earth had begun to pour on me. I was expecting my first child to be born on the last train to motherhood. On the second day of 2013, I found myself lying on an operation table in a hospital in London, and my body hooked up by wires and tubes to harming machines. I was about to burst, literally. The moment when the baby girl was pulled from my womb by a caesarean section, I heard a clear cry, at once familiar but utterly surprising. There she was, wrapped in a new towel with her wet and bruised little face against my breast. I embraced her with wonder and fear. I thought, it's good. This child will be rooted here, and she will be a grounded person, unlike me, a wandering peasant, a cultural orphan. So 20 minutes after the delivery, we were wheeled to the maternity world which was filled with newborns and new mothers. Under the influence of Morphin, I could hear all sorts of languages being spoken between family members here. Hindi, Arabic, German, Spanish, Polish. And I remained in the hospital for the next three days, covered in a thin gown, trying to breast breastfeed and struggling to get to the bathroom after they had removed the catheter from my body. Finally, on the fourth day, we got back home. After returning to the house, the first thing I felt an urge to do was to call my mother. Now I had to tell my mother that I had produced a child even though I hadn't told her I had spent my last nine months being pregnant. <laughs> As was typical of our relationship, we had not spoken in some time, especially after I left China. I had, very, I had made very little contact with my family. I dialed a strain of numbers to my southern China hometown. It was a number I had been dread to use, though it was embedded so deeply in my mind that I could even recite it in my dreams. Mother. It's me. Oh, Shalou, I didn't expect you to call. <coughs> then immediately, she said, where are you? Oh, um, London. What's wrong? What brings you to call me? My mother was direct, almost rude. She used to be a red guard when she was 16. A coarse and uneducated girl straight out from the muddy rice fields. And I always thought that's one of the reasons that we have never managed to get along. I'm fine, mother. I wanted to let you know 
I found myself tongue-tied and unable to speak of the matter. Mother, I just give a birth to a baby girl, and she's healthy. What? <laughs> My poor mother cried. You just gave birth. Yeah, yes, you are a grandmother now, and she's half Chinese, half Western. My heaven! So you were pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> After a few seconds of silence on the line, and I thought she would at least ask for the name of the baby. But instead she just asked, are you coming back for Qingming Festival? Qingming Festival is a day in April. We pay our respects <laughs> to the dead. We sweep their graveyards and burn incense and pray by tombstones. But hearing no answer from me, my mother began to cry in anger over the telephone. You should come back. You don't even know where's your father's graveyard. Now I want to move your grandmother's ashes from her village to lay next to your father's graveyard. It'll be good you return for this. I thought, this time I have no way out. No way. I may as well go back to pay the debt of failure duty once for all. It's only a 12-hour flight, then a few more hours on the long-distance bus. I can do it. But returning to my home province is something I have always tried to avoid, especially since I left China. My birthplace, Shitang, a fishing village where I witnessed my grandparents' depression and poverty, is a place I decided to loathe. Then I spent my adolescent years with my parents in a town called Wenling, which was a cradle for my troubled relationship with authority. I was really <coughs> proud by Wenling. When I went to Beijing in 1993, I promised myself, that's it. I will never return to that stifling backward again. Then 10 years later, when I left China for Britain, I said to myself, Right, from now on, no more ideological brainwashing, and I'm not going to let myself trip over my rotten peasant roots. <laughs> but here and now, decades later, in the Victoria era London house, on the telephone line with my mother, I see that I will have to return to where I came from. I will have to tell my family how I have lived through these years. Just like James Baldwin said, tell it, go tell it to the mountain, tell it to your native king, to the dead souls and the living souls. I will have to face them one by one, no escape. Three days before the Qingming festival, I wrapped my newborn as warm as I could and I took a flight back where my life began. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And for me that's very poignant because it, it makes me think that your newborn, your daughter, um, and you, and the journey that you had as a newborn, and your grandparents, and then meeting your parents when you were seven, and then this return, and the rootedness, there's such a, an amazing sense of a cycle. Um, I don't know if you felt that, but somehow through your own daughters, coming into this world, it somehow resonated for you being that baby and where your life could have been. Because we spoke upstairs about what journeys we have in life and where we are for whatever reason, the graces. Did, did you feel a little bit of that return? I think the reflection is being, you know, I guess as a woman there's something about, you know, the reflection of death and birth, you know, because your body carries another body, you know. I, mm -hmm. I wrote this book, I think just before she was born. So I was just heavily pregnant. And then I was still writing it. She was already one or two, you know, so, because your writing life is so perpetual there. And then this little life was inside you and then just grow up. And you think, God, that person is so big. I'm still writing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the meanwhile, my parents all died you know, from cancer. You know, first, I think when I was pregnant, my father was, was dying from cancer. Of course, I don't tell. I 
didn't tell him I was pregnant because they were thinking, well, you don't know what's going to happen. So I didn't tell him. And then he died without knowing. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had a child. And then my mother immediately died. It's kind of widow's cancer, you know, typical. And then they both died on the year my, my child was born. So I think when I see the reflection, it suddenly become fatalistic reflection. Like, mm -hmm. it must be that kind of perfect narrative. Your parents died, you become orphan. And then you become a real person from the orphan, you know, orphanage, orphanness, whatever that word is. Yes, I don't know how to say it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then you have this newborn in your belly, you know, and you think somebody is so Shakespeare, you know, it makes sense. You know, that's narrative. You know, I think a writer has always wanted that kind of narrative, and that it's happening now when you are writing. And in a way, it's perfect, but on the other hand, it's very painful too. To sort out those deaths and as a verse in you. Yes.